Okay, so here's another example which actually would should probably have been moved a few slides earlier. This doesn't actually fit exactly here, but this is just again meant to illustrate the different layers of um, how how uh, APIs inside Android interact. So on the lower layers, what's written in C++, we have this hardware abstraction layer, which will then, for example, here in the case of Bluetooth, provide access to the different, different components. So here's the, the Bluetooth stack itself, and then there are different vendor extensions. This is actually uh, one example for the things which will create problems when you want to uh, build uh, an Android system for your phone by yourself, because these parts are often the ones that you can't actually really get access to, which are somehow um, uh, kept by the vendor, even if they're supposed to make, make it open source uh, due to the, the uh, Linux license, the GPL, then they often just don't do it and you actually have to, to roll out the lawyers basically to get them to do anything and even then it won't, it's, it's not guaranteed that it will work. So, but uh, assuming that you have these parts, then you can build the entire stack by your own and of course also modify it. And on top of this uh, uh, hardware abstraction layer, then we get, uh, for example, this Bluetooth service. If you want to access anything related to Bluetooth in Android, then you usually go to through one of these services. And this is then again written in Java. In the end, of course, uh, with ART at least, it's also compiled to native code. But uh, the original code is written in Java, first compiled to bytecode, then converted to DEX, and then converted to native code. So it's actually a little convoluted by now. And on top of that, now we have the apps themselves, which communicate with the, uh, with the service using Binder. And the service then uses JNI, the Java native interface, to call functions in the, in the C code, uh, which are then again related to, uh, to the uh, Bluetooth hardware itself. Um, so, now, actually, we're already close to finishing. One more thing I'd like to briefly mention is the topic of, of reverse engineering. So, it's often actually interesting to look into existing apps, either for, uh, for example, for security research. So, if you actually want to know uh, if a specific app is secure or not, then you can't really tell from the outside, you actually have to, to look inside the source code. And also, if you want to do some kind of reverse engineering, I'll give you an example uh, next, then you also need to somehow know what's happening inside the app. And there's uh, two major options available. One is called uh, Dex2Jar in combination with JDGUI. As the name already says, this takes this Dex optimized source code and converts it back to a regular jar. And then with this JD GUI, you can then get a, a rough uh, conversion back from the jar to Java source code. Um, and there's also a relatively new GADX, which is a basically an all-in-one solution. You put in an APK, and then you can start just browsing, the, more or less browsing the source code in Java. Um, there is a countermeasure which is often used by commercial apps, which is called ProGuard. This is also built into the Android Studio already. And this tries to make the, the decompiled uh, source code, which comes back out of these tools, harder to read. So for example, before, uh, the, after the, your original source code has been compiled, um, if it's just a regular Java compilation, then you can, for example, still read all the variable names. So, or the method names. They still tell you what the method is actually going to do or what the original name was, at least. And that can already help you a lot in understanding how the, the app works internally. Um, now, what ProGuard and uh, so on does is just 
uh, across the board rename all the variables and methods to A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on, and then continue with A, 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 B. Um, so you can't actually get back any information anymore from the, from the names of the methods and variables. That's actually very, um, uh, very effective because if you look at this kind of decompiled source code after it's been treated by ProGuard, then it's a lot more uh, difficult to r really make sense out of it than if you would still be able to see what the variable names are and the method names and so on. So, um, yeah, many commercial apps use something like this now. And uh, you can, of course, still reconstruct the, the, um, the functionality because, for example, if you want to call the Bluetooth service we mentioned earlier, then it will still have to somehow uh, make a method call via binder and that uh, can't be obfuscated because otherwise binder wouldn't be able to locate the correct service anymore. But again, it's simply a, a bit more difficult and a um, lot of people actually use that now, especially if you have apps that are, uh, have been uploaded to the Play Store. It's maybe interesting to take one of your own apps just for, for curiosity and run it through this GADX and see what comes out of it, if you can still recognize your own source code. Sometimes it works quite well, but uh, it's, it's basically not an exact science. Um, yeah, to round things off, I'd like to show you one little case example of where uh, reverse engineering, not in terms of security, but in really terms of reverse engineering an entire app was very helpful. So I don't know if you ever came across this thing. It's called the Texter Beagle. This is, was a very small e-reader, very simple one, which was marketed as just being just 10 euros. Um, of course, that didn't really work out. The company went broke pretty, pretty fast, but uh, you could still buy a, a couple of a uh, thousand of these, so they were, were sold and you can, could get them for 10 euros at some point. Um, and the, uh, the interesting aspect about this e-reader was that it's, uh, it only worked in conjunction with, a, with an Android device. And so you didn't actually store books on the device, but the books were actually converted simply to images and uploaded via Bluetooth. And then you could, can click through them on that, on that reader. Um, so, and what was done here was to look at the, the original app by the company and see how it uh, transferred images via Bluetooth so uh, that it was in the end then possible to reconstruct the protocol being used by that thing. And now you can have, uh, here's a, a link to an open source app which you can use to still upload uh, books and so on to that reader even though the company and their, their bookstore and everything is, has long uh, vanished. So this is an example where it actually makes sense uh, to really reverse engineer an app to see what it does because it will then enable you to still uh, to still use something that would otherwise just be you know, have, have become useless. Because of course, the company was hoping that people would buy books so you couldn't just upload your own books to the device. You had always had to go through the app. And uh, even if you just wanted to read a PDF, you would have to, uh, to upload it to their uh, to your account on their store first and then basically re-download it back through their app so then you could in the end read it. And that's of course very convoluted and as soon as the company went broke and that store didn't run anymore, then this device would basically have become entirely obsolete. But uh, a couple people uh, didn't, didn't want to accept that and for that reason you now have this kind of uh, open source solution so you can still actually use that device. All right, I think we're already done for today. It was a little shorter lecture today. Um, are there any, any questions, any comments left? Yes, please. Uh,
such a application which also indicates native code, mm -hmm. native code you have access to different stuff, like file system. Um, and, and no, so. no, no, um, because there's two reasons. Um, because Android is, of course, any Android app is still a Linux process, and so the entire Linux security model still applies. Uh, and that uh, applies to the native code and to the managed code as well. So it doesn't actually matter. So if the process doesn't have access to the file system, then it, uh, it doesn't make a difference if you try to access from native code or from Java. And the same applies to Binder, for example. Binder also has uh, access control mechanisms built in, so you can't just call any service from any app. It uh, has, to, has to be granted permission first. And that le level of access control is done for the entire process. And um, yeah, for the, it doesn't, doesn't matter at that point if it's native code or, or virtual machine code. Yes. So, so it's, the, it's like an application doesn't have uh, permission to access file system, also the native code Exactly. Yes. So they, they basically propagate to the to the process level. All right. If there aren't any more questions, then thanks everyone and basically see you on Friday, I think. I'll post the schedule later today. Okay. See you.